there's so many different subtypes with OCD, but the underlying thing with OCD is that intrusive thought or image that makes a person have to do some kind of compulsive behavior. And it's really, really challenging. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Happily Ever Amber podcast. Okay, so on today's episode, we have Robin Stern. She is a licensed therapist from back east. She is licensed in California, in Florida, in New Jersey, and a lot of different states, which is so amazing. Um, we are having a conversation about OCD and body dysmorphia. This is something that we need to talk about more. We need to understand the research is way behind um, in understanding how we could help people that suffer from um, these two disorders. Um, and I just wanna have a conversation to understand like what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to help not only ourselves if we suffer from OCD or body dysmorphia, but our loved ones. So without further ado, can't wait for you guys to hear this episode. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you for having me today. Good. Thank you for coming on. I don't know about you, but it is freezing in California. You're on the East Coast, right? Yeah, it is it is cold here, but I would say probably for California standards, <laughs> it's probably a little colder. We're a little wimpy here in California when the wind like blows the wrong way. We're like, oh my God, it's so cold. <laughs> I lived in LA for 11 years. So I remember like being excited to like break out the Uggs in a sweater once in a while. And people get very excited, especially in the rain. Everyone's like, oh, it's raining. Um, but anyways, well, thank you so much. Listen, I'm so excited for this conversation today. It's so important. I, I just want to like, like warn people that maybe some of the things that we do talk about, um, this is not like a place to diagnose anyone. I think this is really important for people. If anything resonates with you or you know anyone, I guess, in your, in your life um, that you love that, you know, these are open conversations that we should have with people. And, and it also, more importantly, having conversations um, about OCD and body dysmorphia. Um, for me, it's about having empathy, you know, because everyone struggles differently. And I think this is something that we don't talk about. So I would love to hear your story. You, it's Your story seems really fascinating because not only are you a therapist, but you have experience um, in your own life struggling with some of these things. Yeah, so I, I would say that I, you know, part of body dysmorphic disorder is, is this notion of shame. It's not something that people often advertise that they have and are not that comfortable sharing. And I think probably if you would have asked me like 10 years ago if I would ever publicly talk about it and my own experience, no. I knew I always wanted to go into the helping fields, but I didn't know that my platform was going to be to share. Um, but I think we all know sometimes when we share, we can kind of heal through things. And, you know, my experience, I am 43 years old. I have been clinically diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder since I was 22. And I self-diagnosed myself at 20 and probably was struggling with it since my teenage years. And, you know, body dysmorphic disorder is a disorder where what you see, nobody else really sees. So to an outsider, they can't really see the floor imperfection that you're super focused on. That's where you have kind of that obsessive nature that's similar to OCD of that like intrusive like image and intrusive thought. And then the compulsive behavior for me was mirror checking or I would do a lot of avoidant behaviors. So um, like my senior year of college, I didn't go back to school because I felt like I couldn't leave my house because I didn't like how my skin looked. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, in today's world where people are very focused on appearance, we can lose sight of this and, and think it's vanity. And whereas trigger warning, this is a very serious diagnosis. Um, people that have it struggle very deeply. Um, it's something that they're not really talking about. I would have never thought to talk about it in a therapist's office. Um, and I didn't. I didn't talk about it. I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety and um, never thought to like bring up that, again, trigger warning, like thoughts. It wasn't just about feeling that my appearance wasn't what I wanted to be. It was ultimately feeling defective. It was mm -hmm. feeling like I 
I didn't deserve to be here. I didn't deserve to be in the world like everybody else and feeling very different. And I think, you know, there are a lot of people that struggle with this and, and don't know where to turn, what to do. And, um, you know, I think it's great that social media has been talking about it a lot, but I think oftentimes I've read articles where everyone's like, we all struggle from it. And it's like, we don't all struggle from it. Yeah, that really upsets me when I hear people say, you know, yeah. maybe specifically more with anxiety and panic disorder, because that is something that I um, struggle too. with in, in this house. And it, it's, you know, it's kind of sometimes the older generations that don't want to adapt to it or someone that just truly does not understand what it's like. It's, you know, I thought I was having a heart attack and like you, you you like the suffocation of it so i i get very irritated when i'm like no you don't fucking understand and like you need to go educate yourself because it is so offensive when people truly don't do the homework and i think that's why i love i love learning and educating myself and i want people to be able to have these i want i want to have these conversations with people so people do understand not only are you a therapist right. but you you have experience which which makes you someone who's gone through a lot of therapy in my life even better because you truly know you're it's not just lip service or you know just listening to someone talk about it well i think the hardest thing you're probably not going to love this part as someone who struggles um and i myself more recently have had intractable panic attacks um mm -hmm. is that even in the medical community they don't really understand it and i think that's where i'm hoping you know when i try to speak I want to try to close this gap because for some reason, even in mental health communities, even in medical communities, they, they sort of, even especially with anxiety, it's, it's like, oh, you have anxiety. And it's like, you don't even know, you don't know the depths of the pain, how it goes mm -hmm. through panic attacks. You have no idea how debilitating it is mm -hmm. and what it feels like in the moment. And you're almost made to feel like a joke. Um, and I know for myself, even with body dysmorphic disorder before, so, you know, the word body dysmorphia has been sort of this word that people have used more kind of like, like people are so OCD. It's not really the clinical term. It's okay that people use it. The only thing is, is that I would say most people, like if you were to ha look up at hashtag it on like social media, there are people that have body image issues. And I've spoken about this a lot before. I think we all struggle to some extent with body image issues. When we're looking at whether or not you meet criteria for a diagnosis and really you're suffering is, does it impact your daily functioning? Are, and so you may not like what you see in the mirror, but are you able to go about your day? Are you able, I mean, there were, out, there were days that like the intrusive thoughts were like, eight to 14 hours a day. Like I couldn't escape it. Mm. I couldn't, um, I didn't even know how, and, and truthfully, you know, I, this ages me, but you know, when people were talking to me, I think like, I feel like people thought like, I was like, they couldn't understand it. What are you talking about, Robin? Why can't you go out? Like, I don't see what you see. Like you make no sense. Like something's wrong with you. You're crazy. Like, and none of that feels good when you're struggling with mental health. Mm -hmm. So, I would like to think we've come far in some respects, but I, I will say as someone who's a clinician, who's someone very mindful, um, I've definitely been to a lot of doctors who have very poor bedside manner um, and don't really know how to handle anxiety or panic or even body disorder. They have no idea what body dysmorphic disorder is or OCD. Like, you know, when they think of OCD, they're like, oh, you're clean, you're organized. And then there's this whole array of other themes with OCD that they had no idea that was even OCD. And oh my gosh, tell me, I need to know. Okay, <laughs> so, I really, so I truly don't know. And I do want to jump in also into body dysmorphia and, and yeah, and, no, absolutely. And strategies think, that you use, but I, I kind of want to like cover all of this because I, yeah, this no, it's, really it's important, important because I, I think that's, I don't know if it's, there's no training. Like, again, I specifically obviously have what we call lived experience, right? So I have like over 20 plus years of lived experience of being in the best therapies and the best psychiatrists and, you know, getting educated. I have two master's degrees, but, you know, I'm looking at what's going on in the world. And, you know, while we're trying to destigmatize mental health, a lot of people don't really even know what some of these disorders are. So if we're looking at OCD, 
what OCD is, again, is intrusive thoughts or intrusive images, which everybody has, by the way. But a person with OCD is so like triggered by it. It's like if you look at like when you organize your stuff into like the trash recyclables and stuff like that, a person with OCD can't organize their thoughts. Everything comes in and they're like, this must is trip. This is true. It's like we all have intrusive thoughts, but a person with OCD does not know how to filter it out. And it is so overwhelming. Now, in the OCD community, we have different subtypes. Now, mm-hmm. for me, when I'm working with clients, I just see OCD as OCD. A lot of clients want to know, okay, what subtype I have? I have? So again, this is going to be a little triggering. So just, this isn't therapy, but I'm just going to give you a little background. So there's, there's OCD about relationships. So that might look like, am I with the right partner? Am I attracted to this person? What is this person thinking about me? Are they really interested about me? Am I not? And they're just in this whole spiral. Now, what happens is that's an actually hard one to deal with because it's socially acceptable to talk to friends and family about your relationship. And so no one even knows that you're in your OCD brain because you're sitting there and you're like, should I be with this person? Should I not? Is this person calling me? What are they posting? And so some of the OCD themes are what I call like sort of more regular kind of conversations where people can get away with doing compulsions and somebody not knowing. Where would somebody not? So again, what we would call more taboo themes. So If you were to go and speak to some doctors who just know obsessive compulsive disorder, they're not going to know this. And if they hear this, this is going to freak them out because there's OCD such as harm OCD, which is fear you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else. And that is not the same thing, trigger alert, as having suicidal thoughts or homicidal ideation. Mm. And someone with harm OCD may not even want to go into a therapist's office to discuss that because they're so they feel like they're a bad person and this is OCD but mm-hmm. this is what i see all the time so i think when we think of the same way sort of we only know certain things about anxiety i think certain people just know okay organization with OCD or cleanliness but they don't really know all the like the the finer points of it, which are more the ones that I see. You have OCD that deals with fear that they're gay or straight or fear that they're asexual. And then you have um, OCD such as, um, you know, like fear that, you know, like that they could, like that they're a bad person, that they're just morally bad or that, you know, with religion and all these fears. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different subtypes with OCD, but the underlying thing with OCD is that intrusive thought or image that makes a person have to do some kind of compulsive behavior. And the compulsive behavior could be checking, could be announcing, could be avoiding, um, you know, not having conversations about it. And it's really, really challenging. And again, I think because some of these, what we call taboo themes or things that people don't want to talk about, it's important that we just, we, that people understand that this is part of OCD. And I say that because I've had a lot of clients and it truly breaks my heart who were hospitalized because they shared their thoughts and the hospital was like, you're a danger. And I'm like, Mm. you have OCD. So if psychiatrists and therapists in a hospital can't diagnose you. Mm. You've you I mean I had a client that lost like 10 years of his life just not getting the right support and thinking he was a bad person and he had OCD. It's it, OCD can be very crippling but there's such amazing treatment for it and you don't have to be alone in it. And I think that's my thing even with just any of these mental health conditions we need to destigmatize it. As much as we're trying to, I think we still look at people and say, if you have issues, like you're crazy, like what's wrong with you? It's still not, I feel, as someone who struggles with mental health issues and as a therapist, that it's still not equated with a medical condition. It's like more acceptable. Like if you have diabetes, I have more compassion for you. But like Mm -hmm. if you're struggling with like anxiety, OCD, PDD, like get over it. 
Okay, you guys, it's 2024 and I am so excited. Not only is it a new year and a fresh start, that means that I get to clean the slate with my eating. Green Chef makes eating so easy and it fits every lifestyle. So whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat more of a balanced meal, Green Chef offers a range of recipes to suit your preferences. Okay, one of the things that I'm focusing on for 2024 is my gut health and my children's gut health. We're learning it all starts with the gut. And what I love is that Green Chef is the number one meal kit for clean eating, and they have so many new gut-friendly recipes for each week. You can make this year's resolution really, really easy. You could build healthy habits in 2024 with delicious recipes from the number one meal kit for clean eating. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, yum, and premium protein. Elevate your everyday wellness with the number one meal kit for clean eating and discover new gut-friendly recipes each week. Go to greenchef.com slash 60HEA and use code 60HEA to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Okay, guys, you don't want to miss this. This is the number one meal kit for eating well. So I'm going to say it again. Go to, go to greenchef.com slash 60HEA and use code 60HEA to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. I think one of the things is, and I was actually having this discussion with, with my older daughter and talking about her anxiety and, and the different schools that she's been at. And, and she thinks a lot of her teachers and, and principals and people that she's encountered, administrators, um, that they're mean. And I said, no, 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 honey. I, I, I bet the majority of them aren't mean. Unfortunately, people don't know how to help. And I think that's what we're ha what's happening in a lot of the schools is, and even in the workplaces, is when a student comes, like, you know, teachers are just supposed to show up, they have their lesson plan and teach it. But nowadays, they have to be therapists. They have right. to be, I mean, they're dealing with family issues. They're dealing with all these different learning disabilities. They're not trained or equipped. Like, unless you're a special education teacher, yes, over time, over 30 years, I'm sure you have, you know, you can gain experience and help your students, but it really broke my heart because I just wanted to explain to her that these people aren't mean. It's just sometimes people don't have the tools to be able to help. And just like when she, you know, really started having panic disorder, yes, I could help myself, but then helping a 13-year-old girl whose brain is not developed all the way and then it turning into something even more where she couldn't walk out the front door, I looked at her one day and I was just like, this is bigger than both you and me. And now we both need to go get help because, you know, you just don't know what to do. So I think people being educated is the most important thing. So are, are there, when it comes to OCD, what have you found to be helpful with your, with your clients who maybe their loved ones want to help them? Right. So we have to be careful of that. And obviously as a mom, when you have a 13 year old, it's like, it's even harder. And because part of the work and even when we're dealing with panic so we could we can even look at that for a minute is to allow to some degree your daughter to experience the physical sensations to move through the panic attack mm -hmm. and obviously she um you know can use which strategies i actually use if, if she doesn't have allergies like things like warheads and red hot like that stuff is in my hands at all times by the way i think she saw something um, her friend told her at school was like, Hey, you should get warheads. And I was, and I know that's kind of like a thing that's trending, or maybe I'm just, I feel like I'm oh, always I didn't know that. I'm yeah. always like the last to know. So I could be like, um, but I, you know, Dr. Amon, who's a friend of mine, um, even said like warheads, anything that like shocks your system. And I'm like, that is freaking genius. Where was yes. that five years ago? Like, yes, well, it's a it, it, dollars, it, you know, in medical or like treatments or medication or therapy. It's like, so helpful. It's like, those... it just, it changes your, your brain pathways because in that moment, and it's, this is good for any disorder. So even if we're looking at OCD, BDD, when we have the intrusive thoughts, when we're dealing with panic, with anxiety, 
you're flooded and your brain is on fire. And so we need something to, I, I literally have them here. Like they're in my, like, I, I, I mean, I'm honest. I'm a very real therapist. I struggle with real things. I, my mother will say to me, Robin, why do you share this? I'm like, because those are the clients that want to come to me. They're the clients yeah. that want to come to me because they know I've walked their shoes. They want to know that I've been at the ER for a panic attack. I'm not hiding it. I'm not ashamed. Yeah. I'm yeah. not ashamed. Yeah. I'm not ashamed. I, I get a little emotional when I say this. I want to be the therapist that I've never had. Mm. I never, and I've been to the top of the top. I lived in LA, went to people at UCLA. I, I've been everywhere. And, and I, I, I really, I'm constantly feeling that I, to answer the question of like, what do you do? I think, you know, you first have to find tools that help. Now, the goal in general for all of those disorders, whether it's panic, OCD, BDD, is to eventually allow thoughts and sensations to just be there and not react. But that's very difficult. And uh, for a 13-year-old, it's, it's not a reality, right? And even mm -hmm. myself at times. So things like, I, I like spicy, so I'm like always like, like red hots, fireballs, like the big red gum. Um, but the warheads are new. I actually don't think they're sour enough for so long. My own therapist told me, I'm like, it needs to be sour for another five minutes. <laughs> but it does, sh but it, sh <laughs> it does shift me because it's what is called, it's a tip skill. I don't know if you've heard of DBT skills. DBT, it's, yes. Yes. So it's a DBT skill. It's, it's, a distra it's a tip skill. It changes your body chemistry. And that's why when you're in a panic attack, it's that fight or flight response that just like goes up and you, and once it's there, it's it, it, like, you're gone. But it's, mm -hmm. this has helped me. Another thing, um, which I just got were those ice packs where you can break. And this is good for oh. anybody. Okay. So this, again, this is good for people with OCD, BDD, because even though things look different and a panic attack is an acute situation where you really feel trigger alert that you're dying and mm -hmm. these symptoms feel like, and you can feel like even agoraphobia, like I'm afraid to go out. I'm afraid I'm going to continue to have them. Mm -hmm. um, you can feel that way with OCD and BDD before you even get into the therapy part. So ice packs where you can break them, right? So the ones that you can break carry at least one or two with you. So you have that and you put the cold on you. Yeah. On your also, neck. I always, yes because you need to and watch and then the breathing techniques also like i just i don't know if you've heard of ziva have you heard of ziva technique you need to hear you have to okay i'm gonna send Ooh, it to I'm you so excited. tell me I, well i okay so this isn't an mlm company and i'm not making any money off of it but i'm just like all about any so i'm gonna i can't believe i'm saying this but i think we all don't want to be anxious but I think the notion of not being anxious also is freaking scary, right? When you're anxious. Okay, so I'm listening. My functional medicine doctor goes, you need to listen to Ziva Health. She's like this meditator. And I listen to her and she's like, are you ready to let go of your anxiety for life? And I'm like, what? Like, I've always been anxious. And yeah, I completely get that. It's I said, what are you talking about? Like, I don't think that's like... I'm anxious even thinking about this right now. Like I'm always on a 10. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm a New Yorker, but like, I'm always on a 10. Like, yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. Her meditation, there were two things she did. The mindfulness part at the beginning where all of a sudden I started to shift mm. and I'm starting to ground more. And I'm like, this is very, very bizarre. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to be open to it. And I think that's another thing with mental health conditions. I think we want to get better, but sometimes, and I don't know, I wouldn't say your daughter because she's 13, she's young, but as we get older, it becomes part of our identity. So yeah. This actually brought me to a thought. So I, um, I interviewed Matt Gutman and his book is called No Time to Panic. And he talks about his panic disorder. And that's exactly what he talks about is that we need a little bit of that. When it comes to panic, we need that to keep us alive and keep us on our toes. But it's really just about finding the balance. Like, okay, here's let's let's do a scale. Like, where am I at today? And I now I get why doctors like ask that or therapists ask that when when you're talking about your OCD or or whatever your diagnosis is. It's like you really have to be cognitive of your scale in your life of like how you know the pendulum and how far it's right. going to swing from one side to the next. 
And I think it's hard. I think I think the biggest thing I'm going to say for anybody with with any of these disorders is self compassion. And like that really like resonated. Like when your daughter said like they're mean, like that makes me sad because she's so young. And to feel, I mean, because to me, I feel like when mean, like I I feel the word judgment. Like she feels judged by them, and that like, and to me, I just feel that schools need to be educated on this. I understand they're not therapists. And that's why I didn't decide to teach because I was like, oh, there's a lot of stuff you need to do besides teach the lesson. Mm. And I decided I wanted to go more into the helping field. And I first was a guidance counselor and then I went into, and became a licensed clinical social worker. But I do think that we're humans and we're going to show up with human experiences at school. And the teach I understand that teachers aren't paid a lot. I get that, mm-hmm. but you That's have to be podcast. They are not paid enough, at, like at all. But I continue. know. Sorry, <laughs> I know, and I do. I feel I worked in education. I get it, but I also feel like this is a place like where we're sending our kids. Like my son's four. Like I'm sending my child to you. To, like, and I already experienced it last year. My child shut down. And they didn't tell me. Mm. And my son was three and a three and a half years old, three years old. And you're not telling. Like, I I, I think that educators have to be trained. Mm-hmm. I, I I you know they need to understand what mental health issues are, what anxiety is. You know they're not equipped necessarily to treat it, but they should have to understand what's going on and to be able to have the conversation. I know for me going back to my experience when I was your daughter's age, that's when I started to be bullied about my Mm -hmm. appearance, ironically. And the school did nothing. I was, I I don't know if they knew or they didn't know. I mean, I was getting 20s on tests and I was an honor roll student as I graduated. And, you know, I understand we all have jobs and things, but, but we're raising people and people our interpersonal connections and our mental health is so crucial. And we should never feel that, you know, that we don't understand. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I've been where your daughter's been, where I felt like people don't understand. I've been where she's been mm-hmm. now at 43, people talking to me, like you have mommy issues. Like you need to work on yourself. Like you have anxiety. And I'm like, you don't know what, you don't know what my life has been. You know, you don't know, like, you know, I've had trauma, like you don't know. And I think people either don't want to know or don't see why it's important to know all of this information, Mm -hmm. but they are very much, you know, interrelated and, you know, things with OCD, you know, again, I think the same thing, even with body dysmorphic disorder is people, just the lay person sort of minimizes the diagnosis and everyone's like, Oh, I'm a little bit OCD. Like Chloe Kardashian, like I'm always, I don't think she necessarily, I mean, I don't, I've never met her. So I don't know if she meets criteria for it or not, but then you have the people that are literally like, can't leave their home because of their OCD, Mm -hmm. can't leave their home because of their BDD. And then you have people saying, well, everybody has it. And I'm thinking to myself, did everybody take like three medical leaves like myself? Did people Mm. like get into unhealthy narcissistic relationships like myself? Like, you know, there's so many things and it, and to a person that struggles, it feels very minimizing because Mm -hmm. it's like, you don't seem to really understand. And I think it, I think it comes from a good place of we all want to feel heard and maybe like you're not alone, but I think sometimes we're, we're sort of like watering down what truly some of this stuff is. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. that's dangerous for people who sh- truly struggle with it. Of course. Absolutely. So let's go back to um, body dysmorphia for a second. What are, so we, we, we did some tools f- that could actually be used for a Across bunch of board. different, you know, diagnosis. Let's talk about body dysmorphia and what that looks like because um, it's a crazy world out there. Everything is revolved <laughs> around the screen and there's apps and there's filters and there's body contouring, like contouring, that's the word, yeah. And um, so I, I wanted to kind of dig in and what's some, you know, what the diagnosis is, what's the criteria, how do you help, where, you know, all that stuff.
Okay. So just like anything, I think there's a continuum. But the biggest thing with body dysmorphic disorder is what your concern is. So my concern was my skin, that I felt like I had acne. And to the objective psychologist, she saw nothing. So the difference, I think, between like body image, that's not to say that someone has a severe body defect, but with body dysmorphic disorder, what the person who struggles with it sees, nobody else does. And so that makes it even harder because people can't seem to understand why are you so like, like caught by this? Why are you not able to function? Because I don't even see what you see. So to a person with BDD, it's, it's a mild or non-existent def. I don't even like the word, but this is the DSM-5, defect in appearance that nobody else sees. So if somebody, for instance, does have like a birth defect and has, let's say, a cleft palate, they would meet not otherwise specified OCD if they were like triggered by their appearance, they wouldn't meet criteria for BDD because BDD is about that what they see isn't actually there. And what do we look mm. like? We, we look at for a person, are they pulling back from their life? I was. I stopped socializing. I stopped hanging out with my friends. I stopped going out. I stopped dating. I at times wouldn't leave my house. I was going in and out of the mirror like 200 times. I was like mm -hmm. on top of the mirror like this. So there's a lot of compulsions and checking. There's a lot of avoidant behaviors. There's camouflaging, um, you know, where people would put extra makeup on or, you know, um, and then unfortunately, a lot of people are getting procedures. But a person with body dysmorphic disorder versus a person that doesn't have it is more likely to be very unsatisfied with the results. And it can actually cause worsening in their clinical symptoms. Mm. And this isn't just, this is, you know, studies that are out of UCLA where we look at people's brains with BDD and people who don't have it. And we see that our spatial processing is different. So for a person with BDD, they're not able to see themselves accurately. And that's mm. just a reality that's very hard for a person with BDD to accept. Um, and we, and, and so again, you know, when we're looking at what are we looking at the diagnosis, we're, we're making sure, okay, what they see, no one else is really seeing. And it's not, people will say, well, who are you to say who's pretty? I said, it's not about pretty or not. It's like, if you're coming and telling me that your jaw is crooked and I'm looking at you objectively and it's not, <laughs> it's not about, I'm saying a person's good looking or not. It's about, I have people that are coming to me and they're like, I have acne all over their face and there's nothing on their face. Oh yeah. That, I mean, that was me. So it's like, or somebody who's saying like, I, you know, like my face is, is misshapen and you're looking at them and you're just like, oh my, and I, and I have a bunch of clients. I'm like, oh my God, they can model. And it's like the most heartbreaking thing. And they're just like, no, like I can't function. Like I need to get this fixed. Like this is, this is not working. And so, you know, in terms of treatment for it, mm -hmm. the hope is, and this is the same thing sort of with telling teachers is that that I did like a podcast with a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon is that people like plastic surgeons and dermatologists and esthetician practices are looking for this, but they look for it, but they don't look for it because they need to look for it because they need to cover themselves because I'm going to share that I got a laser procedure on my chest to reduce redness and a $250 laser treatment on Laurel Canyon ended me in three weeks of intensive therapy for $15,000 because I thought exactly because I thought that it damaged my skin. So it would have been better for the PA to say you have BDD. Maybe we should. And I was, I'm honest about it. I don't lie. My dermatologist in century city in LA said to me, you couldn't pay me enough to give you Botox because I don't want to get a phone call from you every single day. <laughs> and I was like, we need more people like you. Yeah. Because they hear, they see someone come in and they want X, Y, and Z done, they'll do it. Yeah, it's just because it's just money, right? It's just dollar signs, it's greed. But it's not, so to answer your question, they don't always come to therapy first. They don't always go to a psychiatrist first. They'll often go to a dermatologist, an esthetician, a plastic surgeon, and it would I try and, and like have done a lot of outreach to try to have people like 
you know, start to look for this because, you know, I mean, and I think there's degrees of it. I think, you know, online, I find it very fast. I'm very fascinated by the the filtering, especially as a person with BDD. I, I don't really understand it. I don't understand why someone filters to the point like they don't look like that in real life. But that's mm. me. I have BDD and that's my biggest fear is that I don't present as I look. So I, when I look at people that just are, look almost like an AI character, I don't really understand what they're doing. Are they just trying to get likes? You don't look like that in real life. Is this a form of artistic expression? But to a person with BDD, they're devastated when they see that because they think these people look like them. And I try, mm. to, tell, I try to tell them. So that's another thing. People who have, I always tell people with BDD, social media is a very, kind of a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. I've done talks on it and I've talked about like, it's not to say you shouldn't be on it, but you need to realize like you're most likely looking at filter. You're most likely looking at someone glammed up. Like that's not, I mean, I lived in LA. Most people don't look like that in real life. They don't want to believe me. And I'm like, we're wearing sweats and going to coffee bean. Like no one's looking like that. <laughs> this is right. But, but to my clients, they see these images and they're, they think they, need to look like that and i'm like yeah. they're not even real and so to them the, yeah sorry i was just gonna ask what what is a tool that someone with body dysmorphia has that they could tell themselves or is it like so it's an intrusive thought right that right. keeps coming back like ocd so we talked about like the the sour heads and all these candies that really get you out of that part of your brain in and into like, what is happening in my mouth? Right. What's the sensation? Um, what is something that you, you recommend for your clients? So what the evidence-based treatment right now for both OCD and BDD is cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure response prevention. So essentially really accepting the diagnosis. And for a lot, I think people are more willing to accept OCD versus BDD. For a lot of my clients with BDD, there's a real big resistance to it because a lot of people with BDD are going to have a hard time saying that this isn't a physical flaw. So it's getting them to sort of come to a place of acceptance and it's reducing the compulsions that they're doing. Okay, so it's so, reducing like going sorry. into the mirror. I totally want to, I keep cutting you off and I'm so sorry. I'm not oh, a okay. great, great host right now. The only reason why I bring this up is because um, I'm going to bring this up because a lot of people don't have the financial means to be able to go and seek treatment or go to a therapist, right? I know that there's a lot of programs out there now. So would you recommend support groups? Because that's like free to the community. Is that something that you encourage? Or do you think when you get a bunch of people with OCD, it just ends up becoming an OCD fest? Like how do you- So I can, I can provide you someone that I know does one. I get very, as a professional, and someone with lived experience, I get very weary of like these like unvetted, like not run by license because I want to be very honest. If you got like 30 people with BDD together, we're not helping each other. We're all sitting there talking about, oh, I need this done. I want this done. Don't you see this on my face? Don't you see that on my face? So, I mean, there's some great books and I can definitely like text, like text you over the titles and yeah. there's definitely like, you know, some, some stuff like even like the workbook and things to work through. I would just like be cautious online because sometimes like it could be more triggering than even helpful. Um, I did try to run like sort of like, like an online support thing. And then it was just getting a lot. It was getting like, people were texting me and messaging me. Like, if you don't mm -hmm. respond to me now, I'm going to do something to like, it was just, well, so I, I don't know if I, you want me to, it's triggering, but one in four people, so this is a trigger alert for people will attempt suicide with BDD. One in four. Wow. 80% have suicidal ideation. 80 it's very serious. Mm -hmm. Yet a lot of people are walking around not diagnosed, going to the plastic surgeon. They know they have it. I've had plastic surgeons want me to sign off that this client can go for treatment. I said, I'm not signing off on anything. Mm. I'm not signing. You can't sign off. I have no idea what they're going to respond. I do everything with my clients. I say, look, you have free will. I can't tell you how you're going to respond after you get a procedure. It's a hard thing, I think for OCD, maybe, but I still think because 
such a core thing for both OCD and BDD is that reassurance piece. You tend to go there in some of these support groups unless they're really run well. I know someone, she's not a clinician, but she knows better than to run it that way. It is a free group. I think it meets old school on Skype every other week. So I could definitely give you that information. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, where do you start if you don't have, is to really reduce the compulsions you're doing, is to understand by checking and even going online. Like if you're really triggered by going online, like get offline. Like there is nothing on social media. You need to live your life. Mm -hmm. Our life is not social media. Like I love being older, knowing that I was able to be fully happy without mm. a phone, without, I, I really can't imagine having this diagnosis in what is going on today because it's just, you're constantly thrown. So one thing just is take a social media break. It's not helpful. You're not going to get what you think you're going to need. You're only going to feel less than, and you're not looking at reality. Um, try to get out of the house every day. Um, you know, try to get some fresh air ground. Um, I always tell people stay out of the mirrors. Don't Google, you know, um, try to share it with someone. Try to, you know, find a family member. I know a lot of people don't get it. You know, my hope is that even if you can't find a specialist, that it's known enough that people that if they're good clinicians could at least try to help like find the way to treat you the right right way i mean obviously it's better to go to someone who has the expertise but if they can't financially afford it then you know at least going into your clinician if you are able to find one through insurance or whatever and, and be able to say look i think i have this and they should have the skill set to be able to uh, you know ascertain if you have it and hopefully understand that like changing your thought process. So looking at your thoughts, challenging them and doing exposures mm -hmm. is the best way. But with BDD also, there's often a trauma component as well that we've more recently seen. So that also has to be sort of like worked through. But like immediate steps would be to remove yourself from situations that are constantly triggering you, like mirror checking, comparing yourself to other people, mind reading. People with BDD are very big into thinking, this person thinks I'm ugly. This person's looking at me. That must mean they think I'm ugly and all these things. And, and just stopping those behaviors will start to help you. It's going to be hard at first, but ultimately what we see with both OCD and BDD as when you stop these behaviors, you, you know, you habituate to that discomfort and it sort of dies down and you begin to feel better. Mm -hmm. And another thing, which most people don't want to hear this is understanding you may never really know what you look like, but to want to figure that out, you're really going to struggle. And that's like, I'm speaking from lived experience. Like I had to relinquish that. I had to relinquish understanding what I look like, because if I, if I stood there, I wouldn't have had all the beautiful things that came into my life. I had to let go of that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I can't imagine because I have BDD. And so when I talk to my clients, I come from that lens that, you know, for other people, they're able to sort of know what they look like. And for people with body dysmorphic disorder or an eating disorder, our brains, I mean, this is a known, you know, functional MRI study. Our brains just don't process it that way. Mm -hmm. And so we have to do all the behaviors to prevent us from, from getting down that rabbit hole because we could essentially really just sideline our lives and not really live. What is the data? Because I also don't want people to think that this is just a female problem. Oh, no. It's equal. It's equal. And I think there's probably more shame for men because men in general are less likely to reach out. And for them, their areas of concern, you know, could be anything. But I've definitely had male clients concerned with like genitalia or concerns with like hair loss and you know, again, I think for men, like talking about it is not something that they're super comfortable with, um, but it's equal. It's equal across the board. And also we see it pretty much in terms of even just different ethnic backgrounds. Mm. We don't, you know, we don't necessarily, we don't see it like it's just a predominantly like, you know, cook it. and then there's just, it's across. And then we even see it truthfully. I remember when I was in a support group, I mean, because again, 
Uh, one of the things I was going to say is when we're looking, let's say, in the trans community, obviously we're looking, they have gender dysphoria, but I actually had some of my someone in my group who was a trans woman, but also had body dysmorphic disorder. So like you mm. could have, there's, there's so much complexity to all of this, you know, and it's just, and, and, and I think, you know, the biggest thing is just, it's just so unfortunate that people just see it as vanity. It's like, I can't explain that it's just not. And I hope people who listen to this know that it's not, it's not, I get it. I mean, I hear it from clients all the time. I'm not deserving. I'm defective. No one's going to ever love me. I'm not good enough. Like I don't deserve to do these things. And, and that's, we have to work on those core beliefs, those, those, those really sort of negative doubting things that just make you feel like you don't deserve it. And we, we've attached it to a body part that nobody else sees. Nobody sees what you, and it's like, and, and it's, you know, I mean, clients will say to me, no, this person's dating me because they feel bad for me. I said, no one is that nice. Like no one is that <laughs> nice, right? No one's that nice. They're not choosing to stay in a relationship because they feel bad for you. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, let's be, let's be honest. Like, that's just not, you know, they, it, I'm telling you, my clients could have every excuse as to why. I mean, they just can't. And it's, it's, it's really very debilitating. And we, the research and the treatment hasn't gone that far in 20 years. And that's very difficult for me to see. Mm. And, and I think, you know, as someone with li living with it, um, I just thought we, we would, we would be further ahead. We're 20 years behind OCD. So it's just, it's, it's very sad to me because it's, I know, I know what it took from me. And I, I, I strive every day with clients to make sure that I hope it doesn't take from them the same, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the same thing with OCD, because it's, it can feel so debilitating. I mean, because it's your thought, it's your brain. How do we disconnect from that? What, what do you mean? If I'm having these thoughts, it must be true. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's that, but what if this time it's different and it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's literally just deprogramming your brain. And, you know, the positive thing is going into 2024, there we know about neuroplasticity. Right. And if, if you think that you can't change, let me just say you're wrong. That Go read the science. Go research. There's tons of amazing YouTube videos on neuroplasticity and steps that you could take every day to change your brain. Um, cause I, most importantly, I don't want people to feel like there's no solution. You're not trapped. You are not trapped. You can get help. You could reach out. There's podcast education, like books and, and research. Um, it just, it truly breaks my heart, but honestly, thank you so much for what you're doing because you're, you're helping, you know, it's a selfless act to be able to do what you do and to, to share your story and, um, your experience with, with OCD or with body dysmorphia. Um, just, I really, really, truly appreciate your openness and, and being honest. No, I thank you. And I want, I don't want people to think that there's no, there's, I want people to know that there is hope, there's help and you, and you can live a very full life. Mm -hmm. And some of the tools you'll gain will actually just be like life changing for you to have them. And I think the most important thing, like I just want anybody who struggles with anything with mental health is please be kind to yourself. Please be self-compassionate. Please, that's the, we all need to give ourselves some like self-love. We didn't choose this and we owe it to ourselves. You know, if we were diagnosed with something else, God forbid cancer, we wouldn't come at hard at ourselves the way we do. And I think that's like the biggest message I want people, just be kind to yourself. It starts there. It starts with self-compassion and then the rest will come into play. There's a ton of help and low fee, you know, therapy and, and lots of books out there and things online and talks and, you know, things that will give you the solution to try to better yourself. And I just want people to feel like they're not alone and that they're heard. Thank you so much. So, for those who want to get in touch with you because you are licensed in California, yes. Florida, New York, New Jersey, right. a couple other states, um, if they want to reach out to you, how how can they get Sure, you? you can email me at 
bbd resources at gmail.com it's or you can look me up online robin l stern lcsw therapy i'm always open to having conversations i've done a lot of podcasts so i feel like i give a lot of information you can definitely go on those if you need me to find you know somebody in your area please feel free to email me i'm always looking to like connect people um i just don't want anybody to feel alone because i definitely know that I didn't have that and I think my family would have loved that support. So um, I'm always here to you know, answer questions and I'm always looking, like I said, for things to help you in the moment. And I think that um, hopefully some of these tools and strategies will sort of help you and you'll start to like see, do I fall into this category? Do I not? Mm -hmm. And where I might start to go to look for some support. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So that was it. I am in shock that the little things, a little thing such as sucking on a warhead or um, the ice pack, genius. That is genius. And this is the reason why I started this podcast. I want to help everybody around me build a community where we could be open, where we could be honest, and we could be vulnerable about the things that are going on in our lives, whether they're great things and we could celebrate them or we need suggestion and tips. So I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe. It really helps me. My goal is to continue to grow this community. And one way that I could do that is if you guys share the podcast to someone that you know and love on your social media accounts um, and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. So thank you. I hope everyone has a blessed day. Yay Networks.